Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Patriots History. It's gone on Monday, Labor Day. Um, <clears throat> I labored. <laughs> I lost half of a chapter of um, one of my uh, one of the chapters in my new book, A Patriots History of Globalism. Both the word perfect and the word document were gone. I think I know how I did it. I screwed up, shouldn't have done that, but I was able to reproduce and put back in a lot. I will tell you as a writer, and I've had musician friends tell me this too, it's never as good the second time around. Whatever I write, if I have to replace something, it's almost never as good as when I wrote it the first time for whatever reason. You'd think it'd be better. You'd think you'd think about it a while, maybe do something better. But with me and with a lot of musicians, it comes from the heart. And when you write the first time, you, you kind of have that fire. Second time around, it's more like doing surgery where you're trying to replace certain broken bones, right? Rather than just creating the man. Anyway, <clears throat> so I wasn't here Monday. I will not be here next Monday either. Because I've been invited to the William Tell International Fighter Interceptor Bomber Competitions. It's a Top Gun type event down in Savannah, Georgia. So I'll be going down there to chronicle part of that. I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. I don't think I'll see Tom Cruise there, but you never know. Anyway, so I won't be here next Monday. So uh, we'll do this one. And I'll be here Friday. All right. And so we are. Oh, yeah, I got to remind you. I am using <clears throat> Patriots History of the United States, the 15th anniversary edition. If you have an earlier edition, you're okay probably with the 10th. You go back much before the 10th. Um, obviously, the page numbers are going to be different, but even some of the headers may be different if you go back too far. So um, I urge you, if you don't have it, it's cheap. It's only 20 bucks on Amazon. Get an updated copy of Patriots History of the United States, 15th Anniversary Edition. Um, <clears throat> we're now in our 40th printing. So even when the editions don't change, Mike and I update little errors or little things that we can improve upon or fix that stay within the page. I mentioned this before. I told you how this works. Okay, so we are in Chapter 5. Uh Small Republic, Big Shoulders, and I am in the header quasi-war, <clears throat> and I'm just about to start on the top of page 162. <clears throat> Adams already had his hands full with a peacemaking initiative without the interference of George Logan, a Pennsylvania Quaker who traveled to Paris on his own funds to secure the release of some American seamen. Logan may have been well-intentioned, but by inserting himself into international negotiations, he endangered all Americans, not the least of which were some of those he sought to help. His actions spawned the Logan Act of 1799, which remains in effect to the present, forbidding private citizens from negotiating with foreign governments in the name of the United States. And I think in the Reagan years, we're going to see that um, Senator Ted Kennedy probably violated the Logan Act. He was writing letters directly to Soviet leadership and to Nicaraguan communist leadership, basically contradicting things that President Reagan said in trying to end wars there or get the Soviets to stand down or whatnot. He should have been prosecuted. In my view, he should have been prosecuted for the Logan Act. But, of course, he wasn't. <clears throat> Meanwhile, buoyed by a 1798 electoral sweep, the so-called arch-federalists in Congress continued to call for war against France. Pointing to alleged treason at home, they passed a set of extreme laws, the Alien and Sedition Acts, that would prove their political undoing. A naturalization act aimed at French and Irish immigrants increased from 4 to 14 the number of years required for American citizenship. The fact that these immigrants were nearly all Catholics and Republicans no doubt weighed heavily in deciding their fate. 
A new Alien Act gave the president the power to deport some of these, quote, dangerous aliens, while the Sedition Act allowed the Federalists to escalate their offensive against American Francophiles, I mean, people who love France, <clears throat> by abridging First Amendment speech rights. The Sedition Acts forbade conduct or language leading to rebellion. And although the wording remained rather vague, Federalist judges evidently understood it. Under the act, they arrested, tried, and convicted, and jailed or fined 25 people, mostly Republican newspaper editors, including Matthew Lyon, a jailed Republican congressman who won his re-election while still behind bars, which we have this today, this whole <clears throat> business of the 14th Amendment. I think I went over some of that last time. Obviously, we'll get to that by the time we get to Reconstruction. But courts have, with a couple of exceptions, which were never appealed, by the way, uh, ruled that the 14th Amendment cannot be used to keep people out of public office, that you can run for office from jail, as did Eugene Debs in 1920, Lyndon LaRouche in 1992, um, and presumably you can win office from jail. I think uh, uh, James Traficante also um, campaigned from jail. I'm not sure I'd have to check on him. He was an Ohio congressman, famous for the phrase, beam me up, Scotty. Which, by the way, did you know? little history trivia here. Captain James T. Kirk never ever in all Star Trek episodes said, beam me up, Scotty. He said, beam us up, or Scotty, get us out of here. But he never used the exact phrase, Scotty, beam me up, or beam me up, Scotty. Did you know that? Interesting. All right, so let's keep going. <clears throat> Application of modern day values, not to mention civil liberties laws, would make the Alien and Sedition Act seem outrageous infringements on personal liberties. Would they? I'll just mention this. Just yesterday, a guy known as one of the Proud Boys who entered the U.S. Capitol on Patriot Day, J6, was sentenced to 22 years for insurrection. So if you think that these can't happen today, well, yeah, they can. They do. In fact, at first, the acts were quite popular, with most Americans only changing their minds over time. And in the era's legal context, the sedition clauses originated in the libel and slander laws of the day. Now, this is a area where if we had better libel and slander laws today, uh, you might not get a lot of stuff said in public media that is said. I, I don't think it's entirely right that because you're a public figure, anybody can say anything they want to about you. Uh, I think it's rather grotesque that um, a so-called comedian, Kathy Griffin, could come out and hold a severed head of President Trump. That's just outrageous. That ought to be punishable, but it is not under our laws today. <clears throat> Personal honor was a value most Americans held quite dear, and malicious slurs often resulted in duels. The president of the United States, subjected to vile criticism, had no means of redress to defamatory comments. It'd be almost a half a century before courts routinely held that a much higher bar governed the protection of public figures' reputations or character from attacks that, to an ordinary citizen, might be considered libelous or slanderous. <clears throat> Newspapers rushed to Adams' defense, with the Guardian of New Brunswick declaring, quote, sedition by all the laws of God and man is and ever has been criminal. Common law tradition in England long had a history of restricting criticism of the government. But with the French Revolution threatening to spread the reign of terror all across Europe, public criticism took on an aura of fomenting rebellion, or at least that was what most of the Federalists thought, provoking their ham-handed response. Adams, above all, should have known better. Suffering from one of his few moral lapses, 
Adams later denied responsibility for these arguably unconstitutional laws. Yet in 1798, he neither vetoed nor, nor protested them. Republicans countered with threats to disobey federal laws known as the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions, authored in 1798 and 1799 by Madison and Jefferson, respectively. These resolutions revived the anti-federalist spirit with a call for state sovereignty and comprised a philosophical bridge between the Articles of Confederation and the Tenth Amendment and John C. Calhoun's 1832 Doctrine of Nullification. Madison and Jefferson argued from a, quote, compact theory of government. States, they claimed, remained sovereign to the national government by virtue of the fact that it was the states, not the people, who formed the union. Under this interpretation, the states had the duty to, quote, judge the constitutionality of federal acts and protect their citizens from unconstitutional and coercive federal laws. Such a lock-in argument once thrilled true revolutionaries, but now the Declaration, through inference, and the Constitution, through express statement, repudiated these doctrines. Remember that the Declaration said that it was the people of these colonies, not the colonies, the people. And it made a second or third, I can't remember how many total, a second or third reference to the people, not to the colonies, suggesting that the uh, energizing element behind this was not the colonies or later the states, but was the people of the colonies and the states. Um, if one follows the Jeffersonian's logic of deriving all government from first things, however, one must go not to the Constitution per se, but to its roots, the Declaration, wherein it was the people of the colonies who declared independence in the preamble to the Constitution, which admittedly is not law itself, but the intention for establishing the law still begins how? We, the people of the United, not we, the colonies, not we, the states, but we, the people of the United States of America. In either case, the states never were the activating or motivating body, rather simply the administering body. No other state supported Madison or Jefferson's resolutions, which, if they stood, would have led to an endless string of secessions. First states from the Union, then counties from states, then townships from cities. Header on page 163, Adams' Metal and the Election of 1800. In one of his greatest triumphs, John Adams finally rose above this partisan rancor. Over the violent objections of Hamilton and his supporters, he dispatched William Vans Murray to negotiate with Talleyrand. Remember, Talleyrand, Charles Talleyrand was the French foreign minister who had managed to survive Louis XVI the French Revolution, the Jacobins, the guillotine, Napoleon, and was, was uh, now Napoleon's foreign minister. <clears throat> the ensuing French capitulation brought an agreement to leave American shipping alone. With long-term consequences unsure, the short-term results left the quasi-war in abeyance and peace with France ensued. <clears throat> Adams showed his mettle and resolved the crisis. As his reward, one month later, he was voted out of office. Much of the anger stemmed from the higher tax burden, some of which the Federalists had enacted for the large frigates. Remember, we, we spoke uh, last time about the construction of these uh, frigates that would not help Washington or Adams, but would ironically help Jefferson, who didn't want them. Um, a new tax, though, the direct tax of 1798, penalized property ownership, triggering yet another tax revolt. Freeze Rebellion, wherein soldiers sent into Philadelphia to enforce the tax encountered not bullets, but irate housewives who doused the troops with pails of hot water. Freeze was arrested, convicted of treason, and sentenced to be executed, but he found the Federalists to be far more merciful than their portrayal in the Jeffersonian papers. Isn't it interesting that in all these rebellions, Whiskey Rebellion, Shays Rebellion, Freeze Rebellion, many of these people were tried, found guilty, sentenced to be executed, and in all but two cases, they're, they're, uh, they were pardoned. 
and how many of these people in Patriot Day, January 6th, have been pardoned? Got them? Adams pardon freeze, and although the tax protest shriveled, so did federal support in Pennsylvania. It bears noting, however, that in the 19 years since the conclusion of the Revolutionary War, Americans had already risen in revolt three times and each on occasion of taxation. In 1800, the president spent much of his time in the new city of Washington. Hardly a city at all, the District of Columbia was but a clump of dirty buildings arranged around an unpaved, muddy cesspools in winter, waiting for summer to transform them into mosquito-infested swamps. Adams disliked Washington. He had not liked Philadelphia much better and managed to get back to Quincy, Massachusetts to his beloved Abigail whenever possible. Never possessed of a sunny disposition, Adams drifted into deep pessimism about the new nation. Although he ran against Jefferson again in 1800, this time the Virginian, a shadow man, as Adams called him, for his ability to strike without leaving his fingerprints on any weapon, bested him. Anger and bitterness characterized the two men's relationship by that point. Of Jefferson, Adams wrote, quote, he has talents I know and integrity, I believe, but his mind is now poisoned with passion, prejudice, and faction. <clears throat> Political warfare had soured Adams even more than he had uh, than he had become president. Hamilton, whom Adams called the quote bastard brat of a Scotch peddler, vexed him from behind and Jefferson from in front. Besieged from both ends of the political spectrum, the Jeffersonian Republicans blamed him for the Alien and Sedition Acts, while Hamilton's arch Federalists withdrew their support because of his peace with France. Adams was left with few friends. When the Electoral College met Jefferson and his vice presidential candidate, Aaron Burr, tied with 73 electoral votes each, Adams trailed in third place with 65. Then, as in 1796, wily politicians tried to alter the choice of the people and the rule of law. Jefferson and Burr had tied in the Electoral College because the Constitution did not anticipate parties or tickets and gave each elector two votes, one each for president and vice president. A tie through the election to the lame duck Federalist House of Representatives, which now had the constitutional prerogative to choose between two Republicans. To make matters worse, the Federalists expected from Burr, but never received, a polite statement declining the presidency if ever it were offered to him. Burr had other ideas, hoping some deadlock would result in his election in spite of failing to win the Electoral College and all of his prior agreements with the Republican leadership. <clears throat> House Federalists, with Hamilton as their de facto leader, licked their chops at the prospect of denying Jefferson the presidency. Yet the unscrupulous and unpredictable Burr was just not tolerable. Hamilton was forced to see the truth. His archenemy Jefferson was the lesser of two evils. By siding with the Virginian, Hamilton furthered American democracy while simultaneously and almost literally signing his own death warrant because it'd be Aaron Burr that in a couple of short years would kill him in a duel. Colonel Burr would soon take vengeance against Hamilton over letters the secretary had written supposedly impugning Burr's honor. Meanwhile, the lame duck president frantically spent his last hours ensuring that the Jeffersonians did not destroy what he and Washington had spent 12 years constructing. The Republicans had decisively won both the legislative and executive branches of government in November, leaving Adams' only hope for slowing down their agenda judicial appointments. His unreasonable fear and hatred of the Jeffersonians led him to take a step that, although constitutional, nevertheless directly defied the will of the voters. <clears throat> In February 1801, Adams sent a new Judiciary Act to the lame duck Congress, and it passed, creating approximately five dozen new federal judgeships at all levels, from federal circuit and district courts to justices of the peace. Adams then proceeded to commission ardent Federalists to each of these lifetime posts, a process so time-consuming that the president was busy signing commissions into the midnight hours of his last day in office. These so-called midnight judges, as the Republicans soon dubbed them, were not Adams's only judiciary legacy to Jefferson. 
In the final weeks of his tenure, Adams nominated the lame duck Senate, approved John Marshall as Chief Justice of the United States Supreme Court. Marshall's appointment was, Adams later wrote, quote, a gift to the people of the United States that was, quote, the proudest of my life. Throughout a brilliant career that spanned the entirety of the American Revolutionary Era, Adams left America a great many gifts. In Marshall, Adams bequeathed to the United States a Chief Justice fully committed to capitalism and willing to amend pristine property rights to the cause of rapid development. Unlike Jefferson and fellow Virginian John Taylor, who weighed in as one of the leading economic thinkers of the day, Marshall perceived that true wealth came from ideas put into action, not vaults of gold or acres of land. Whereas the Jeffersonians, Taylor, and other thinkers such as William Googe would pin the economic hopes of the country on agriculture and metallic money, especially gold, Marshall understood that the world had moved past that. Without realizing it, Adams' last-minute appointment of Marshall ensured the defeat of the Jeffersonian ideal over the long run, but on the morning of Jefferson's inauguration, America's first involuntary one-term president, his late son John Quincy would be the second, scarcely felt victorious. Adams departed Washington, D.C. at sunrise, several hours before his rival's inauguration. Adams was criticized for lack of generosity toward Jefferson, but his abrupt departure, faithful to the Constitution, echoed like a thunderclap throughout the world. Here was a clear heir to Washington, narrowly beaten in a legitimate election, not only turning the levers of power over to a hated foe, but entrusting the entire machinery of government to an enemy faction, all without so much as a single bayonet raised or a lawsuit threatened. That event would be described as the most important election in the history of the world, with one colossal exception in 1860. The fact is that without this selfless act of obedience to the law, John Adams ensured that the principle of a peaceful and legal transfer of power in the United States would never even be questioned, let alone seriously challenged. Now, a few things about this. First, <clears throat> it was questioned. In 2000, Al Gore not only questioned the election, he fought it through the courts until the Supreme Court, by virtue of a constitutional clock, had to weigh in and say, no, Mr. Gore, you are trying to count only counties favorable to you, and we do not have time to count all the counties again. And so in Bush v. Gore, they struck down his challenge. In 2016, Hillary Clinton challenged President Donald Trump's election in three states, and in each case, eventually, after a whole bunch of shenanigans, the challenges were either overruled or withdrawn. President Trump challenged the election in 2020 on the grounds that in at least five states, counting was halted in the middle of the night by some unknown phone call, and that when counting was resumed, all of a sudden, Joe Biden mysteriously jumped ahead in all five states. To this date, and I'm speaking now as of September 6th, 2023, we have never yet had one single court examination of the evidence. I repeat, no matter what you've heard, there has not been a single court examination of the 2020 evidence, most notably the key evidence, which is ballot signature match. If you want to determine whether or not there was fraud in the 2020 election, you can look at the 2000 mules, you can look at Dominion machines, whatever, you, but the key test would be a random sampling from the five key states, Arizona, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, take 10,000 ballots at random from each of those states and check them against signatures to see if there is a signature match from the people who registered. A typical normal uh, mismatch ratio is 3%. In almost any election, you're going to have people that sign weird or there, there's some, some reason or who knows what, but the signatures won't quite match. They'll be kicked out. But if you saw in these 10,000 ballots in these five states each, over 5% signature mismatches, I think you could say there's something fishy in Denmark. 
That's all I'm going to say about that because of YouTube. I'm going to get kicked off. All right. One last point on Adams. This is the second time in four years in which the electoral count came down to the president of the Senate, who is the vice president, who is John Adams. This time, last time it was Jefferson. <clears throat> I'm sorry, last time it was Adams. This time it is Jefferson. Sorry, I got him back. So in 1796, vice president was Adams. He became president. This time, the vice president is Jefferson, and he now is about to become president. And there is once again a disputed electoral slate. Folks, there's no such thing as fake electors. There are often multiple elector slates. Every state draws up two slates of electors, probably three if you have libertarians, in case one of the other wins. Uh, in Hawaii in 1960, we had three slates sent into Congress, and the vice president at that time, who was Richard Nixon, had to decide which one to accept, and he accepted the one he thought was right, which was the one that went for John F. Kennedy, his rival. Now, it didn't make a difference in the election, but Nixon did what Jefferson did in 1796, which is he didn't challenge an electoral slate that had clear problems. So we have another electoral slate, this time in Georgia in 1800. And Jefferson this time is doing the counting and the reading. Remember John Adams sat down for a moment and awaited a challenge from Jefferson indicating one, he had the authority to do so. Two, Jefferson had the authority to make such a challenge. Three, if he made such a challenge, the constitutional likelihood is that Adams would have sent the challenge back to the respective houses. But Jefferson, very patriotically, did not challenge the electoral count. And so after a while, Adams stood up, but he gave Jefferson a chance to make this challenge. No such chance was offered to Donald Trump in 2020. Just saying. What happened in 1800? In 1800, Jefferson was the one counting the ballots. He was the one who stood to be president. This time, he didn't sit down. He just accepted the flawed Georgia electoral slate and counted it. So he has the authority to do that as well, right? The vice president, the president of the Senate, has the authority to accept or reject any electoral slate as he sees fit, even those that do not meet the constitutional standard. Just think about that for a little bit. Okay, I'll see you guys back here on Monday.